All right, everybody, I uh, want to thank you for coming to today's Social Issues Roundtable for SFN. Uh, my name is Dustin Tyler. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm also a research at the Cleveland VA Medical Center uh, that I work for the Advanced Platform Technology Center as well as the Functional Electrical Stimulation Center. I've been in the field of neural interfacing for 27 years at least. Um, my knees tell me that's been at least that long. <laughs> it's like getting old. But we've been working at this idea of, uh, of connecting between humans and machines for a very long time. Uh, we've called it rehab, basically, for 30 plus years in the Cleveland area and across you know, this, this meeting as a whole in different areas. We've looked at this idea of connecting the machine, but we've been putting it in the medical context. Today what we're talking about is uh, trying to extend that or thinking about what that means in a bigger, broader picture. And so we're looking at this idea of human fusions and, and what I'm going to emphasize in my part of the talk and what you'll see through this is we want to think about not so much as technology and the human is separate, which is basically how we look at everything. Technology is helping us do things, we interact with it. But rather, what is we think about of a symbiotic relationship between the technology and the human? It's a, it's a mind shift a little bit in what we're doing. And when we start looking at that, that brings into a whole bunch of other issues that relate to both the social, the economic, the individual pieces. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to raise the idea in general about the social issues of the human technology, the human digital interface, the neural digital interface. And I'll kind of go through why the, the neural digital interface uh, has some actual importance in what we're thinking about. What we've assembled here is a, a team, and, and we did a, a kind of a press briefing earlier, and I can tell you that um, when I get down and sit, I'm in awe of listening to the rest of this panel. And what we have across here is not the tech, so we start with, um, no, I'm not through there yet. <laughs> this is the introduction, those are my time. <laughs> uh, but what we have is from, from Doug and myself from the tech side, but we get away from that quickly because I think most people here are familiar with a lot of those pieces, and you'll see a lot of talks, and our students are out in the poster sessions. But we really want to talk bigger about what it means to start thinking about the human technology mix that's possible by connecting through the neural systems in various ways. And so across the panel, I'll introduce them briefly when it gets to their part, but beyond myself and Doug, we have Brandon Prestwood, who's actually a user. I mean, this is a, he's a person that actually uses this technology and can talk about it, not just from, I feel my hand, which has been great, but he's been with the program for a very long time, he can tell you what it actually means to him as a human. Um, and then we're going to move out of the technical side into what I think is actually far more interesting and, and for me has been fantastic in conversations is to think more broadly about the idea of democratizing this technology. What's it mean when you start thinking about everybody having this or getting together and how do we approach it from many different levels so we think about the whole picture. A lot of us gets buried at the neuroscience. We get, we get ourselves very deep in our labs about looking at what the exact uh, charge density might be or the, the ion flow. But we really need to look at this from a much broader perspective, and that's the goal of this session, is then to move to Nick Zingali um, to talk about this from a phenomenology. What's, it, what's the phenomenon, the phenomenology of, of experience? Then Emma Jane Alexander is going to talk about um, some of her experience with more of the social, psychosocial aspects of connection and this idea of this uh, neural reality we're going to talk about. Uh, David Hodge is going to talk about the idea of inclusion, like um, it's been great for me from conversations like how do we make sure the digital divide doesn't increase, how do we make sure everybody's included in this going forward, and it's from multiple perspectives that are very important. And we'll wrap up with uh, Suzanne Rivera who is, gonna, is a bioethicist and we'll talk about this on a grander scale, wrap this all up in the ethics um, in general, and then we'll open up to a round table. So we hope to keep this fairly short, Doug wanted it even shorter since he started before my talk. <laughs> We want to keep this short enough, about 12 to 15 minutes for each of us to get the idea there, but then we're looking for a, um, a conversation afterwards. It, pretty much every time we get together, one question, that pretty much takes care of the rest of the hour amongst ourselves. So we think that there's an opportunity for a nice vigorous discussion about what the future looks like and where that's at. So with that, I will start myself. <laughs> So I want to introduce to you this idea of human fusions and really thinking about changing that relationship between humans and technology and what that means. Um, and so we're beginning this, uh, you'll see throughout here, we'll talk about this Human Fusions Institute idea. And it's really thinking beyond just the interface and the technology, but to the bigger picture of what we're doing. So let's think about the relationship to tools as a starting point, right? And there's often this worry about augmentation of the human. You hear these type of things brought up. But I have to say that from the first time we put on furs or we use sticks and stones, 
and tools, we've been augmenting ourselves. We use tools to our benefit from the early times, right? But the thing is, over 100,000, several hundred thousand years of evolution, our tools have become amazing, right? You'll see this about AI, you'll see interconnected systems, cell phones, etc. But the thing that hasn't changed is our relationship to those tools. We still touch the cell phone. We still basically use our hands, interact with these in a very isolated sort of way. And so what we're looking at is this idea of thinking beyond that. How do we move to a different relationship between technology? What is the, the world of neuroscience, the things that we're doing here at this conference and others like it, what actually transformative thing can that bring to us? And so we think about this term of neural reality. And so we're familiar with virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. But this might be longer than this session to ask what is reality. <laughs> um, but really we started to think about that question. There's a real good neuroscience way to it. I want you to start thinking about this. And we were having a discussion actually after the morning session that the question came up that maybe that's not the right question. It's the right question is how do you make reality? And so it's an interesting idea when you think about that, but it's important when we think about what is it that we do when we interact with the world. And the other side, we hear a lot about AI and we hear about technology, whether AI is going to replace the human, it's going to be better than we are. Where we have CRISPR and we have all these synthetic biologies um, where we can actually change the human biome in different ways. And we have this arguments of robotics taking over for humans, etc. And I actually think those are the wrong questions, or I want to posit that that's not the right way to think about it. Rather than this war between the technology, what we're really trying to do is say, how do we interact with it in a new way that allows us to do something we hadn't been able to do before? And if you combine them, the idea is that we can now think about not so much the robot versus me or me operating a robot or it's running on its own, but how do I become that robot? How do I actually interact with it in a completely different way than we had done before? And so to get back to that question of what is reality, how do we make reality, I'm going to want you to think about, and this is great about this meeting, is we can say to neuroscientists, what is reality? And it's actually very interesting when you think about it. Everything that our brain takes from the world, right? Everything that's programmed, this beautiful thing in our head we're all studying, basically came from the senses, right? Your reality is the entirety of the senses you bring in, and then your brain works with it to make it something. But all of our knowledge, all of this reality begins with our senses. And so the idea is if we can connect to those senses, if we can basically through a neural interface, which is what I'm going to get at here, we've been working at, by starting to talk to the, the brain and that system directly through those sensory systems, we in fact now can say we can augment, we can connect in a way that's unique. And we think that this has, or we want to discuss the opportunity of this as a, a, a transformative evolution, if you will, in that relationship between the human brain, technology, and society. Because you start thinking about having that connection on a digital system that's a societal connection as well as it is a technology uh, connection. And so when I talk about the uh, human brain, obviously, I want to make sure it's clear, I'm talking about the entirety of the nervous system. So we're not talking necessarily BCI in its traditional sense of cortical prostheses. We're talking about the breadth of the interaction to the nervous system. And there's lots of different ways and examples out there and advantages for certain ones at different times. But we think if we can do this, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about this a bit in sort of um, our examples of what we do, and then you're going to hear from our subject. But if we can sort of take those connections, those senses to myself, and move them, they're not limited by the physical body any longer. What we can do is transcend the barrier of the body and allow us to achieve, you know, sort of humanity's fullest potential. That's what we want to get across today and plant in your mind and talk about this direction. So, Am I crazy? Probably, but here's the thing that uh, we're jumping from and to do this. So we've been working for a long period of time, for quite some time, with people with um, spinal cord injury and stroke in different areas, but in terms of uh, prosthetics, and you'll hear from one of our subjects today, um, we basically, uh, when you lose your arm, you lose the hand, obviously. You lose the sensors themselves, but the wires that we connect are still there. And so most people, up until the work recently that DARPA has done uh, a lot to spearhead in the different work, and then uh, for me through both DARPA and the VA, we were able to basically say, if I put um, that device on there, and then if I can connect that to the nervous system, they can directly feel what the device is touching. And so we asked our subject, we said, you know, what is it when you use the prosthesis with and without sensation? And without sensation, they say it's a tool. You know, I have a tool on the end of my arm, or what's left of my arm, and I'm out there just grabbing things, but it's, it's just a tool. The immediate second we turn on sensation, and this isn't, I don't even ask the question so much, they start saying it's my hand. That phenomenological, and I apologize if I use the word wrong, but that idea of that now becoming them, that part of them is actually the transformative piece. And here's what's really strong, is that beyond the fact it's connected to their body, it's digital. I can put that hand, that prosthesis, that robot, anywhere in the world, and it will still be his hand. He can still feel that hand. That is huge. 
Because now the hand is not the barrier as to how far he can reach, how far he can feel. It's where I can place the hand and what I can connect him to over the digital systems. We have the similar work that we've been doing, Ron Triolo and, and, and uh, his team, myself, looking also at the foot, so we can do the same thing at the feet and the limbs. And there's a lot of other things you'll see coming up, but this is across the body as we begin to interact with the nervous system, we're actually connecting to that input system to the brain at different points. And so now you can really think of that, you can extend your senses anywhere in the world, and that's the piece where now we're transforming the body and doing this. That's the opportunity that we think is unique and is a, is a transformative way of thinking what's going on. So as an example, I'm gonna show a short video um, in this case where uh, this isn't totally you know, just made up, we're actually doing this type of work. And so this is, um, we've been working with the DECA hand through DARPA for the prosthetics project. But we've set that in another room. Um, and I think Brandon will talk a bit more about this later, but um, he's in one room on the right. The hand is in a completely different room, not even near him, or that he can't see. I know in one part of my mind it's over in the other part of the room. I was kind of watching and dealing with it right here, like it was happening here. You know, I'm nervous about shaking people's hands and start with because I fear hurting them. The sensation, it, it tells me, okay, I'm touching enough that it's firm. I can actually tell a difference in this right here from the, the start of the sensation to mashing down hard. I've searched through bolt bins trying to find things. Without the sensation, you're just digging. You, you don't know what you're coming up against or whatever. So I could see it being applied to, to buried ordnance or something. And best case scenario is the operator's not there. Nobody else loses a hand. I've never been in that situation, but nobody else hurt is great. So I mean, this uh, to emphasize at the end, I mean, basically he's nowhere near that, but he has a functional task where he has to be able to feel what's going on and use his hand in a normal way, but he can do that at a distance. So we start to think about this and what are, the, what are the things we can do? Of course, within the domain of health, you know, we can start to think about this as if you're being anywhere, anytime. Um, in, uh, we'll get to that in a second more, but uh, in the health, we can continue obviously with prosthetic stroke in that area. But as we begin to add touch, for example, there's a, within Cleveland, there's this hollow anatomy. The idea is that we don't need a book any longer a cadaver. You could actually see the anatomy in 3D realism in what's going on. But the problem is you can't touch anything. So imagine if you could add this sense of feel to know what a diseased liver or a heart or a blood vessel or something is, not just look at it, but actually touch and manipulate the device. If you can get to that point, maybe you could do virtual surgery where the, the feedback or the robotic surgeon somewhere around the world, that feedback is coming in directly to your hands into the true haptic interface and what's going on. Uh, telemedicine, obviously, you know, uh, I think most uh, clinicians would tell you that the laying of hands or the, the personal aspect, not just from the diagnostics perspective, but actually interacting with the patient, that comforting piece of having touch is important. And so reaching out and doing uh, telemedicine or even maybe some advanced diagnostics where ultrasound could be used as a tactile input. So we can now start to think about that information channel very differently than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we're already in the, the human machine from the prosthetics perspective, but what else can we do with this? These humanoid robots are trying to become like human. But what if the humanoid robot could be human-like in its mechanics, but I could actually be in that robot? So if you had to be in Fukushima for cleanup, for example, you could be there mentally, your mind can be there, and you could feel what you're doing, but you aren't there biologically in that environment. Or, uh, for example, in explosive ordnance disposal or something where you don't really want to be there to make the mistake if we can make this robotic system where you have that human capability. Remote environments and, you know, even now I can, I can magnify you in many ways, right? I can take sensors from any sort of tool, no matter what size, and scale it to a matter of your hand and we can go back and forth between single environmental. Remote meetings and all these type of things are, are uh, bits and pieces that we can think about from the human machine interface. And then, of course, there's a whole social realm, which is when we start to develop into the rest of the panel, well not, you know, into develop into the rest of the panel what can go on, is thinking about what is it when we can now do a social network. My, my, use, uh, my mother is an example, she likes to send emojis and text me about what's going on. But she can't ever express the emotion she wants to, so I get five lines of emojis and hearts <laughs> and smiley faces, like, uh. But I, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the sentiment, but imagine if she could actually just, or my wife, while I'm here, could squeeze her phone that senses mm -hmm. that and I could feel her holding my hand at that perspective, right? I mean, this is a whole new idea of social connection, social environment. And of course, entertainment, media, and gaming all become very different in what they're doing. So where are we at now? We're, uh, you know, these are types of things. Many of you have different programs. We're probably early next year have a completely implanted system that will have this sort of connection to the human with a Bluetooth system, which if you're gonna say, well, that's only great for medical uses, I wanna point to the fact that, uh, you know, 
Cell phones, when they first came out, fit in your car, cost more than your car, had one cell tower, hardly worked, right? But outside of the whole gender and socioeconomic problems with this, this figure, <laughs> <laughs> I really Thank like you. the tagline at the bottom, <laughs> right? Which is a person getting home at 186,000 miles per second. That's powerful, right? That person's anywhere, anytime. And so the other part of this is that was cell phone a while ago. And if you had the naysayers that said that's never possible, like, you know, every one of us has a cell phone today and probably more people have a cell phone than electricity. So this is not the barrier to getting us there. It's, it's the, the value proposition. And so there, Doug will talk about the, the things that are going on to get to minimally invasive or even maybe external devices that are possible for this. So the, the end of this then is why we have this panel. We often, and I started my career in the tech side. How do we do it? I can make stuff, that's really cool. But then I met Brandon. I met our subjects and I actually found out what they cared about and what they needed, right? What should we do? We start to think about the ethics as being really important about what it is that we do. The, the technical side is actually the easiest part. Um, ethically, what should we do? How should we do it? Regulatory, once we've decided the ethics, how do we manage it, right? How do we manage it so it still gets to people like Brandon? but also is not done in an unethical and unsafe sort of way. So there's ethics on both ways. If we make it so hard to get the technology out, we're also hurting people. So we have to find that right balance in moving through the regulatory thing. Entrepreneurial, we've got to get a paradigm shift, right? I mean, there's a, how do we get this stuff out of the labs and actually into commercial value? Um, then the societal, does it actually improve the human well-being in what we're doing? So there's broad things that we need to work together, and these things are iterative that we have to work with each other all the way through this. And I hope by the end of this panel, You'll see that, and uh, that's what we're working towards. So overall, we're putting together this idea, this human fusions as a whole institute that we're working towards, um, and I, kind of that sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. And at this point, you know, we're really trying to do the symbiotic connection. I think that's a key word. It's a symbiotic, not co-adaptive, not co-robotic, symbiotic, actually integrate a mutualistically symbiotic relationship between the brain, technology, and society to enable the mind to transcend the barriers of the body so we can achieve our full potential. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. We're not going to have questions between each of the talks because I think you'll see by the end the whole is better than the parts. Then we'll open it up for questions from everybody. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug Weber.